you to, to, to mute your microphones during uh, the presentation. And when uh, Martin's finished his presentation, uh, it will be opened up for uh, questions, uh, comments and, and discussion. So uh, as I said, we've got Dr. Martin Black from the Independent School of Philosophy on the problem of technology, Heidegger and Aristotle. Martin. Thanks very much, David. And thank you all for, for turning up. I had a, it was a very stimulating discussion the last time I, I spoke. And I'm gonna share a screen to bring up a handout that I've produced uh, to form the basis of this discussion. Now, as the title intimates, I want to discuss the thought on technology of Heidegger, who is manifestly one of the great thinkers of the problem of technology, and Aristotle, who is not so reputed. So I'll have to justify that. I've um, prepared enough material for seven or eight hours discussion. So I'm going to skip lightly over some of the pages of this text and hopefully get to Aristotle, and then we can have it a, have a, an open discussion, which I, you know, I, I anticipate will be of great interest, as the last one was to me. Um, and just to open up the, the problem, I'm going to begin with a quote from Heidegger's essay, The Question Concerning Technology. And in this handout, if you're looking at it at any point, if there's a number by itself, it refers to that essay in the in the translation, which is on this handout, which I'm happy to send around um, as a you know, resource, object of ridicule or refutation um, afterwards. But I'll begin with this quote of an example of what the problem of technology is. Only to the extent that man for his part is already challenged to exploit the energies of nature, can this ordering, revealing happen. So technology is not something fully under our control, it's a way of understanding the world which grips us in our imposition of its framework upon nature. If man is challenged, ordered to do this, then does not man himself belong even more originally than nature within the standing reserve? That is, um, we come to see nature as merely a, a, uh, a standing reserve of energy or information, etc. Um, and then that framework places us within it. The current talk about human resources, about the supply of patients for a clinic gives evidence of this. And obviously our, our language has proceeded well beyond those early intimations that we're thinking of human beings as uh, products or elements of a manufacturing or service process. The forester who in the wood measures the felled timber and to all appearances walks the same forest path in the same old same way as did his grandfather is today commanded by profit making in the lumber industry whether he knows it or not he is made subordinate to the orderability of cellulose which for its part is challenged forth by the need for paper which is then delivered to newspapers and illustrated magazines the latter in their turn set public opinion to swallowing what is printed so that a set configuration of opinion becomes available on demand. And now, I don't know how plausible it is to strongly differentiate the, uh, the, the forester in the early period from the forester who works for the lumber industry, but there is something I think very true in Heidegger's description of all human processes in, processes, trades, activities um, being utilized to one end. And that end is not something determinate, no human activity or excellence or beauty or whatever, but rather the continuous production of further means of production or therefore the storing up of energy or information and so on. And uh, his example made me think of a comparable example. If you're in Australia, in, uh, at least until a few years ago, Every, every street would have a corner store and you might go to buy a, uh, a meat pie and a beer and go look at the sunset. Although um, our, our premier recently banned looking at sunsets as part of a new technological program to do with health apparently. Um, but that's different 
from um, being involved, for example, online as we are now, because there is a well-known corporation whose uh, name I don't need to mention, who is accumulating information about us, you know, through the phones of billions of people, through their devices, and they sell devices that come into the home that monitor everything said and everything done on those devices and within the home as a whole and reports all of that. And that's not sufficient for this corporation. Um, it's recently bought a DNA registry so that it can complete its whole understanding um, of every particular human being. And what's, what's vital to understand about the, the operation of this company as, a, as an expression of the problem of technology is that it's not doing that so it can sell that information. It's doing that so that it can manipulate us to do certain things. Now, whether those things are commercial or political is irrelevant, but that, that's, the, that's the object. And that power will ob obviously only increase. So I take that to be an exhibition that something in what I think Heidegger is profoundly correct to point out is just becoming exacerbated in our time. Of course, I say that on Zoom. Um, now, so what, what was originally a means of controlling non-human nature to, in uh, Bacon's expression of this, to endeavor to establish and extend the power and dominion of the human race over the universe is now being used upon human beings to manipulate and make them in certain manners uh, in a, yeah. And uh, you know, there are two examples. Um, one is climate change, which I'm informed by my government, the UN and all universities that it's a real enormous problem. Sometimes people throw around the word existentialist, which I regard as being uh, out of place in that context. Now I have no reason to believe after the experience of the last two years that anything the UN or my government or a university asserts is even vaguely true, but many people find this persuasive. So I mentioned that as one possibility. Um, the other is there recently emerged a, a sixth or seventh coronavirus. Um, it turns out we made, we, we made or enhanced that coronavirus, whether or not we released it, that's, that's a separate question. Um, but our reaction to it was not like the reaction to the first five or six that existed. Um, and it consisted in the destruction of all the principles of a liberal democratic society. So that's technology having a destructive effect upon human activity, I suggest. Okay, now I, I threw in a couple of random examples of uh, people who don't understand their role as uh, professors of philosophy or medicine, um, but I, I leave that there for your, your attention if you have time. Um, I will go on instead to the question of the relevance to, of philosophy to technology, given that technology appears to be the mode of understanding and action that is recent or contemporary, and therefore to which ancient philosophy in particular has no relevance, um, and philosophy as a whole has no relevance because philosophy is posterior to science. Um, now, the response to that is, <clears throat> twofold. First of all, um, modern technology is the offshoot of a philosophical project begun by people like Bacon and Descartes, which is why I'm quoting Bacon before and I'm about to quote Descartes. And secondly, I tend to find the classics persuasive that there is a human nature that's unchanging throughout history and that what history is, is a variety of answers to the same questions posed by human nature. Now, if that, was, if that view was true, and it's widely rejected today, of course, um, if that view was true, then you would expect to be some, expect to see some evidence that the same questions are being posed, even if they're answered radically differently in different epochs. And what I propose to do is to show that the same question is posed in, in very similar ways in these different epochs. So I begin with, a or possibly the classic modern statement on science as technology. And this is from Descartes' Discourse on Method. So Descartes says that when, when he'd acquired certain general notions about physics, uh, not metaphysics, he didn't derive his physics from his metaphysics. Um, then in place of that speculative philosophy, that is the philosophy that teaches that knowing is the highest thing, that contemplation or speculation is the highest thing. And that's the, the assertion of classical philosophy 
from Socrates, Socrates on. So Socrates, Xenophon, Plato, Aristotle. Um, in place of that speculative philosophy that is taught in the school, he, he conceived of a, a practical philosophy um, by which, because it knows the force and actions of fire, water, air, stars, the heavens, and all the other bodies that surround us, as distinctly as we know the different trades of our artisans, we could employ them in the same way in all our proper uses and thus make ourselves like masters and possessors of nature. So the elements of nature here, possibly crudely expressed, but the elements of nature are mastered by us as if we are artisans. That is as people who have a, a techne in the, the Greek word for an art or a craft or a skill is techne and that's obviously the root of the word uh, technology. Um, so then modern philosophy replaces the classical notion that the highest is contemplation with the notion that the highest is mastery or practico production right? um, by modeling thought on, on a techno. So, and this, this change in the understanding of philosophy is expressed in the preface to the principles of philosophy by Descartes, which I'll, I'll read this excerpt from. Thus, the whole of philosophy is like a tree. The roots are metaphysics. Now, I should say that the roots, the metaphysical roots in Descartes are almost entirely apologetics. They're, they're not essential to his thought as physics is, as I mentioned in the quote above. The trunk is physics and the branches emerging from the trunk are all the other sciences, which may be reduced to three principal ones, namely medicine, mechanics, and morals. By morals, I understand the highest and most perfect moral system, which presupposes a complete knowledge of the other sciences and is the ultimate level of wisdom. Now, just as it is not the roots or the trunk of a tree from which one gathers the fruit, but only the ends of the branches, so the principal benefit of philosophy depends on those parts of it which can only be learned last. Okay, so metaphysics is not the end. In, in Aristotle, for example, the highest end of philosophy is the contemplation of being qua being, and the first beings, which is metaphysics. This is the opposite. It's, it's the result of the production that is of any worth. Um, so there's no knowing for its own sake and um, the result. So morals is a result. That means your physics can produce the moral outcome you want. Now, just to give you an example, I'm gonna skip back to the first page where we have someone called Parker Crutchfield, Associate Professor of Medical Ethics, Humanities and Law, Western Michigan University, who says the following, moral enhancement is the use of substances to make you more moral. The psychoactive substances act on your ability to reason about what the right thing to do is, or your ability to be empathetic or altruistic or cooperative. I argue that the covert administration of a compulsory moral bioenhancement program better conforms to public health ethics than does an overt compulsory program. In particular, a covert compulsory program promotes values such as liberty, utility, equality, and autonomy better than an overt program does. So not only does this moron want to inject drugs to make people cooperative, <laughs> um, he wants to do it covertly and you know, he rationalizes this as beautifully as being more conducive to liberty. Um, so that's the level of discourse that we've reached um, at the final end of Descartes' program where we will be able to produce the mor morality you want. Um, and this person suggested putting things in the water. And there's, there's many, many people like that if you um, have time to search on that unnamed company's internet search program <laughs> for such things. Okay, so that, that's the modern expression of technology's structure and its aims. And uh, there's a very similar um, expression of the question in uh, Xenophon, so a, a classic ancient author. And I will read part of what he is saying that Socrates would say in criticism of those who study the, what he says, the sophists call the cosmos. So those who study the whole, the whole of nature, as opposed to the human ends uh, within nature. Um, and I'm going to read the, the part highlighted in bold. And he, that is Socrates, used to examine them in this regard too. 
just as those have examined the human things, that, for example, the technai, the arts and crafts, um, including legislation, lawmaking, statesmanship, as well as shoemaking, shipmaking, and so on. Just as those who examine the human things believe that whatever they learn, they will produce for themselves and for anyone else whom they wish. Do those who examine the divine things, he means the cosmological things. Um, he's in a passage where he's partly defending Socrates from accusations of impiety, but Socrates was obviously impious and we can ignore this rhetorical flourish. Um, he means the cosmological, ontological things. So for anyone else, uh, yeah. Do those who examine the divine things believe that whenever they understand the necessities by which each, things, each thing comes to be, that they will produce whenever they wish winds and waters and airs and anything else of the sort they need, or do they not have this hope but are they satisfied and just understanding how each of these things comes about? So same question, should we or should we not have a science that controls the elements of nature to our ends? And that's the question, the same in Descartes as in Xenophon. Um, Xenophon produces arguments by Socrates saying that we should answer the question differently because given the, the priority of our understanding of the ends, to the means that we use to those ends, then we should focus on that and not the means. Um, but so I'm, my suggestion therefore is that there's enough similarity in the formulation of these questions to give at least, to at least allow us not to dismiss the, the classical notion that there's a human nature that's the same historically, despite the answers that we provide to the questions it poses to us. Now, so the, for the rest, I want to give an outline of Heidegger's essay, um, outline parts one and two of the essay, and then a critique, which will contain some summary of part three of the essay, and then pass to a brief comment about Plato and Aristotle and a concluding suggestion. So Heidegger's essay, the first part, and I've added in, in square brackets, these are my additions to the, the summary and, and quotations from Heidegger, um, but I've, I found them helpful to divide up the way in which he articulates the argument. So he begins from what he calls the correct understanding of technology, um, which is the instrumental and anthropological definition. That is, technology is a means or an instrument and it's a human activity, um, which he summarized by saying it's a contrivance, an instrumentum in Latin. Okay. Now, that definition, that techno technology is merely a tool, an instrument of us, um, is an error because it leads us to the notion that we can master it. And somehow technology has mastered us. And that, that's, I think, one of his key insights. Um, so he says, we're not looking for the, just the correct de definition. We are seeking the essence. And he says of the, the essence that only at such a point does the true come to pass. Does the true, the truth, occur or happen. And this is an early hint of how he's going to reconfigure the language of the traditional language of philosophy, which refers to the truth and essence as follows. The essence of the thing is the unchanging standard or principle by which you can judge it. So there's a healthy kangaroo <laughs> or a sick kangaroo. That's because there's such a thing as health and kangaroos by which you can A, recognize and B, judge the state of any particular kangaroo you happen to come across. And the same with artifacts like houses. They either do or they don't effectively hold out the rain and keep you warm and so on. Um, now, so that means there's an unchanging atemporal character to things. And Heidegger's central point is that there is no such thing. Truth is something that comes to presence and passes out of presence. Truth is, is temporally given, historically dispensated, however you wish to um, characterize it. Okay, so he begins this placement of the instrumental, first of all, in causality, and then causality in the emergence of things in the process of the truth coming to be. And I'll, I'll proceed, first of all, through the causes. So he then says instrumental, instrumentality, which is our correct but not true definition of technology, is embedded in the notion of cause and effect. And then he examines First of all, the, the four causes, which he, he says were taught for 
centuries. Um, and he provides the Latin version of those because that's the version in which they were, they were, were taught. Um, and the examples here, so the material cause, that is, for example, the silver of a chalice. And he, he's using a chalice because in the, the essay, well, yeah, there's an essay called The Thing, which was a lecture preceding this lecture when he originally gave these talks in Bremen in 1949. Um, the material cause is the, the form or character of the thing as finished, so the, the finished chalice. Uh, the final cause is the, the end. Um, purpose brings into play things like intention, which are inappropriate, but the end as the completing activity of a thing. And in this case, the sacrificial rite that requires the chalice, and then the effect, efficient cause, which is what brings it about. That is the silversmith. So that, and that's a re, what he's said here, uh, is a reasonable translation of what Aristotle means by um, the four causes. Now, his objection to our understanding of what Aristotle originally taught um, is that what we mean by cause, that is. Uh, something that affects something else, brings into being something else, um, is inadequate to what Aristotle originally taught. His claim is that instead, they thought of four ways of being in, of something, being an indebted to something else, which is responsible for the thing in question. The Greek word is aition, which I think it's, well, it's closer to being responsible for than being indebted to, but he's using a, a, an idiomatic German phrase that has these other connotations. But the fundamental cause of IT on is to be to, to blame for something. So you could have a charge in a court of law against you. That's an IT on. Um, so you're, you know, so being responsible for something is, a, is a, quite a reasonable translation. And it's obviously much broader than, you know, to use Hume's example, <laughs> one billiard ball affecting the movement of another. And that, that, that's his basic point. So as the origin of motion, which is what came to be translated as the efficient cause, the silversmith is not an, an efficient cause. He rather gathers together the three aforementioned ways of being responsible and indebted. And he will elaborate that on that, what that means shortly. Um, now, the next movement he makes is to go, he, he either goes beyond Aristotle, if you approve of this step, or uh, beneath Aristotle. But what he is saying is that what unites these ways of being responsible is a primal meaning, which is to bring something into appearance or to let it come forth into presencing. Come forth into presencing is the uh, translation for unvasen, which he's, He's now using, deliberately suggesting that the essence of something, it's vasen, is a process that becomes visible un to someone. So instead of saying that things have an essence, they come into their essence to someone or to a particular people. So the essence of things is temporal. He also characterizes this as an occasioning or inducing to go forward, fur an lassen. So to allow something to come forward to someone. Now, he uses a passage from Plato's Symposium to justify this movement by saying that there is a single primal meaning of the occasioning uh, or causing aspect of the, the, what are called the four causes. And this passage, if you translate it literally, it would be every cause of anything whatsoever coming out of uh, non-being into being is poiesis. Is, and, and what you know, Socrates means in this passage is that every human act of production brings, some, brings about something that wasn't there before. Now, for Socrates and Plato's Symposium, that's poiesis or human acting or making on the one hand, because on the other, we are confronted by the fact that as natural beings, we all die. Our action or production in the face of that self-awareness is the expression of the quality of our eros or desire, whether or not we produce 
uh, a family or other, other human beings that we educate, or on the highest level, we produce poems like Homer and Hesiod, whose children, he says, have temples, right? The gods. So the poets produce the god. But higher than production is theoria, is looking upon the being well, or beauty as it is. So that's that classical notion where contemplation is the highest and production is secondary. Now, but um, Heidegger, and I'm not saying that, you know, He's uh, mistranslating. That's that's irrelevant. What he's doing is like every every philosopher. He appropriates passages and thought from the past in order to bring bring into expression his own thought. But I'm just trying to explicate how how different his understanding is from the from the people he appropriates. So he translates that passage as follows: Every occasion for whatever passes over and goes forward into presencing from that which is not presencing is poiesis is uh, bringing forth. So he is saying that the fundamental process of coming into essence, of coming to be visible, is poiesis, whereas Aristotle and the Greeks in general contrast poiesis with physis, with nature. And But Heidegger explicitly assimilates poiesis to both techne and physis. They're both ways of something being brought forth, something being brought into appearance, and he doesn't make the distinction that the classics want to make. And I'll read this quote. Bringing forth comes to pass only in so far as something concealed comes into unconcealment. This coming rests and moves freely within what we call revealing, the process of revealing, not the revelation of something that's, you know, eternally true or atemporally true. The Greeks have the word aletheia. The Romans translate this with veritas. We say truth, wahrheit, and usually understand it as the correctness of an idea. And I'll just link it for one second on these words. So aletheia, as he's about to point out in this next paragraph, um, has the root lethea. Lethea comes from the the verb lamphanaim, which means to, that something escapes your notice. You're oblivious to something. And so Heidegger wants to claim that that root, oblivion, lethere, is the root of the word truth with the alpha privative at the front. So the want of oblivion is something coming into presence, something becoming visible. So that's a, a reinterpretation of what truth means from what the, the classics thought that the truth is the revealed character of a thing that's always the same. In fact, it's what's necessary. Human nature is necessarily X, Y, and Z. And if you don't have that, then there's no human nature. And if there are no human beings, there is no human nature. But if there are human beings, then they have the character of X, Y, and Z. You know, animals that are rational, imaginative, and political, for example, to use Aristotle's definition. Um, but that's not the case for, for Heidegger. He wants to claim that instead of the truth being a temporal in that sense, it's a temporal process in between forgetting and presencing. The truth is given temporally or historically, um, and previous philosophers, especially paradigmatically, Plato and Aristotle, have only responded responded to what is present to them, um, and having made the mistake of taking what is temporarily present to them as what is true, they have therefore characterized the being of things, which is the unintelligible, mysterious process of the dispensation of the presence of things, um, they, have, they have characterized that by the character of the beings available to them. So Plato takes the character of beings to be their idea or ados, their form or their character to the mind's eye. Um, and he takes, therefore, being itself to be an idea, um, a thing. And from Heidegger's point of view, that means you have mischaracterized the being of things um, as a thing itself. Okay. That was part one. <laughs> um, part two. So what he hopes to have established in part one is that we initially understand technology as a tool or an instrument. And that's, that's correct, but not true. What, what it really is, is a mode of revealing and a temporal one given to us in our time. 
Um, and so he summarizes, technology is no mere means, technology is a way of revealing. And I, I think that's one of the many true things he says. <laughs> okay, so then, then he discusses the, the etymology of technology, which begins with the word techne and technicon, uh, technites in the Greek. And he makes two points. One, techne is the name not only for the arts and skills of the craftsman, which is a technites, someone who possesses a techne, but also for the arts of the mind and the fine arts. And you know, Aristotle, for, on the first page of the ethics, Aristotle characterizes the activity of the bridal maker, the general, the lawmaker, all with having a, a, a techne or an episteme or dunamis, but fundamentally is having a techne. Now, more importantly, techne is linked with episteme, which is the, the word for science or knowledge, and is a way of opening up or revealing. Um, that is, and, and he, he's deliberately using terms that he associates with accessing the truth. In, in Greek, that is aleth, aletha And if you, in book six of the ethics, Aristotle discusses five ways of revealing the truth. Um, techne, episteme, sophia, nous, and phrenesis. Um, and so Heidegger here is saying, beyond our instrumental notion of technology, uh, techne is more informative because it's a way of revealing or understanding the world. It's not simply a tool. Again, I, I think a persuasive argument. So he concludes from two things. The examination of whether or not technology is just an instrument under our control and from the etymology of uh, the word technology as follows. Technology is a mode of revealing. Technology comes to present and presence. You could say essences in the realm where revealing and unconcealment take place, where aletheia, truth, happens. Okay. So it's no mere tool, it's, it's a way of revealing the world. Um, it, yeah, where, yeah, and therefore it's a mode of truth. Truth as, an a, as a temporal happening, not as an atemporal um, essence. Okay, then he poses a possible objection. Isn't his etymolog etymologizing about techne irrelevant to modern machine technology? which is based on modern physics as an exact science. And he responds, modern technology too is a kind of revealing, not as uh, poiesis, but as challenging forth. And he's going to develop this thought, and I, but I'll, I'll just complete what I should have made more clear here. Um, what he says is that modern, modern technology is only apparently based on uh, modern physics as an exact science. In fact, they're both, both based upon a way of revealing, revealing that is prior to them both. Um, I would characterize that differently. I mean, there's something profoundly true about it, but I would characterize it differently. The change in the understanding of what science and philosophy as a whole is in early modernity, Bacon, Descartes, et cetera, um, is prior to many of the achievements, say Newton of modern science and prior to the developments of various apparatus like microscopes. But that sets in motion modern technology because it re-envisages the relation between thought and human activity, thought and the human good, um, which leads to that development. And it's, yeah. Um, Okay, I'll read this quote where he characterizes this, the way of revealing as modern technology. The revealing that rules in modern technology is a, a challenging. So Herr Forden is something like being called out, <laughs> uh, which puts to nature the unreasonable demand that it supply energy that can be extracted and stored as such. But does this not hold true for the old windmill as well? No. Its sails do indeed turn in the wind. They are left entirely to the winds blowing, but the windmill does not unlock energy from the air currents in order to store it. Now, again, I'm unsure about how strong a distinction one can make between the older arts and crafts 
and modern technology, despite the fact there is a massive <laughs> uh, and imposing technological edifice that is increasingly controlling our lives in the way that the old arts and crafts don't. Point taken. But uh, I, I don't think the force of the distinction can be borne by those differences, but I make that suggestion. Um, so, but his suggestion is that modern technology is different from previous technologies because it does not work with the forces of nature, but rather challenges or sets upon nature, not for some particular purpose, but to have it stockpiled or ready for use. Hence, the revealing of modern technology is one where everywhere, everything is ordered to stand by, to be immediately on hand, to be the standing reserve. And you could think of the way we use the word resources. We must develop more, why? So we have more resources, why? So we can undertake further development and have further resources and so on. Now, then he undertakes to explicate what is responsible for this situation. Is it a human decision? He says, but man does not have control over unconsumement. That is the process by which the truth emerges itself in which at any given time, the real shows itself or withdraws. The fact that the real has been showing itself in the light of ideas ever since the time of Plato, Plato did not bring about. The thinker only responded to what addressed itself to him. Man is thus ever more originally than nature, set upon or forms part of the standing reserve of technology. Yet precisely because man is challenged more originally than are the energies of nature, that is, into the process of ordering, he is never transformed into mere standing reserve. Now, what he's suggesting here is that we are imposed with a, a view of the world that allows us to see nature only as resources for energy and information. And increasingly, we are becoming objects of that view. And we understand people only as human resources and sources of information. But precisely because um, we are undertaking that activity, we can never totally be preserved, be, um, sorry, be ranked with the resources. And this is going to be an element, the, the element um, by which he thinks um, we can ameliorate our situation. So Hardiger names the, the essence of technology, well, this is word gestell, which is translated variously in framing, positionality. Now, apparently gestell means things like a, a scaffold, a framework, or like glasses frames. Um, but he means that he uh, puts the apostrophe between the, not the apostrophe, puts the dash between the, the prefix ge, which he, argues is uh, a prefix that implies the gathering of a thing together in order to be named, like, the, um, like a mountain range, Gebig. Right, to capture, yeah. So he uses this, this word um, to capture a framework that imposes upon humanity, that then impose that framework upon nature and understands nature only as the standing reserve of energy or information. So, in framing, it means a way, since it means a way of revealing, it's nothing technolo technological, nor reducible to technological activity. So that was the correct definition, <laughs> the instrumental definition that we first had. The mode of revealing of uh, poiesis is fundamentally different, but related in its essence as ways of revealing of aletheia. So the original way of any, that anything is brought forward to presence he called po poiesis. Um, our way, the uh, gestell, is also another way of revealing. It's a particularly reductive one, um, but they're equally, they're equally expressions of the temporal uh, character of the truth. Then he raises another objection, which is that mathematical physics arose almost two centuries before technology. And he says, 
chronologically speaking, modern natural science begins in the, in the 17th century. In contrast, machine power technology develops only in the second half of the 18th century. But modern technology, which for chronological reckoning is the later, is from the point of view of the essence holding sway within it, the historically earlier. Now, so he wants to locate modern technology prior to the development both of physics and machine power. And I think that's correct. I'm locating it with Bacon and, and Descartes with an explicit philosophical decision, um, but in agreement with his, his suggestion that these, these are later developments of an, of an, of an earlier understanding. Um, but that's why he says it's a deceptive illusion that modern technology is applied science. And you know, one of the suggestions he's making is that when we think there are problems with technology, for example, say you had multiple studies showing that children are losing intelligence and happiness every year because there are devices in their schoolrooms, in their private lives and so on. Well, of course, we'll just put in place a program of online protections and we'll have online uh, learning for them so that they can protect themselves better from what's online and so on. And uh, I think persuasively, he argues that this makes the problem worse and we're not thinking it through. Okay, recapitulation. And these I, I take to be four insights of his that are, I think are quite powerful. First, technology is nothing technological. It's a dominant, it is a, a way of dominating in the world, um, which is revealed to us because we are set to revealing only that aspect of the world which constitutes a manipulable, uh, manipulable resource. Our, second, our understanding of causality in the Aristotelian sense has for a long time, for a long time, been narrowed to the causa efficiens, the, the efficient cause, which is not equivalent to the techne, the, the art or the techni test, the knower of the art in, in the classical sense. Um, Hume would be a good example of that. The effective cause, that's the, uh, the billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. So clearly our modern science is based upon an extremely restricted notion of what an intelligible cause is. Now, obviously, many people would argue that that's because that's the truth and everything else is a uh, philosophical fiction. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to suggest reasons for being open to the, the form of view. Third, technology was established with or before modern science prior to development of machine power technology and advanced scientific apparatus. Four, all of modern science will never be able to renounce this one thing, that nature reports itself in some way or other that is identifiable through calculation and that it remains orderable as a system of information. I think that a, 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 a proposition that should be even more persuasive now than when it was uttered in 1949. So I think those are very persuasive. Now I'm going to suggest some reservations that I have, and I'm happy to be um, refuted in our discussion shortly. And I'm gonna do this by way of discussing some of the aspects of part three of the essay, the last part. So Heidegger wishes to maintain that being or the meaning of things is given historically. Each historical epoch, both A, disposes of human behavior and B, needs human activity to occur. Now. I'm asking the question, how are both those things possible? Because if human, if human beings are disposed to act in a certain way, then what specifically human activity is there? Because we normally understand human beings as choosing to do things and we judge people by their choices, or at least that's the old fashioned uh, activity. <laughs> I'll, I'll read this passage. The essence of modern technology starts man upon the way of that revealing through which the real everywhere more or less distinctly becomes standing reserve or resources. To start upon the way means to send in our ordinary language. We shall call that <clears throat> sending that gathers, which first starts man upon a way of revealing. In this translation, destining. <laughs> it is from out of this destining, <clears throat> that is experiencing as a destiny, as a fate that the essence of all history, human history, is determined. Excuse me. Okay. 
history is neither simply the object of written chronicle nor simply the fulfillment of human activity. That activity first becomes history as something destined. And is, it is only the destining into objectifying representation that makes the historical accessible as an object for historiography, the writing up of history, that is for a science. And on this basis makes possible the current equating of the historical with that which is chronicled. So what he, I suggest what he means is that the disposition of a people to understand events in a, in a certain way is prior. And then if you come along to write history later, you will write that in a derivative manner to that first understanding. Okay, so if my suggestion, if human beings historic of, are historical in this sense, we must abstract from everything we think we know about their ability to choose against unchanging principles. Now I say that because there are classical authors who think that human beings are beings that, that make choices in their actions against, uh, in the light of, measures or principles that are untenable to the human mind. It's not now a popular view, but I, I just express it. Um, for Heidegger, the voice of being speaks. Remember, uh, he said that Plato you know, heard the voice of being and could only respond. And the only difference in our response is whether we become someone who A, listens and hears, that is, comprehends, or someone who is simply constrained to obey but that makes no difference in our actions, which is a, a departure from the older way of understanding a human being, a conscious departure. So freedom no longer means individual choice or collective responsibility. It means the character of the truth as a process of revealing and concealing. Something becomes free or visible to us, which means it loses all intelligible meaning in the sense of something accessible, however, indistinctly, or partially to the intellect, freedom does, the process of freedom, as opposed to the object of vague attitudes such as hope. And now I, I quote Heidegger, freedom is that which conceals in a way that opens to the light. That is, it's the process by which the truth, aletheia, emerges from what's in oblivion, lethe, in whose clearing there shimmers that veil that covers what comes to presence of all truth and lets the veil appear as what veils. Freedom is the realm of the destining that at any given time starts a revealing upon the way. Uh, so therefore our choices are as follows. Our current historically situated choice, A, pushing forward nothing but what is revealed in ordering the technological processes and of deriving all you know, human standards from that. Or alternatively, to experience as our essence our needed belonging to revealing. So this is a development of the clue he made earlier that even as constrained by a technological view of the world, um, we still have to participate in that revelation of the truth. And so that means we can't be entirely reduced to the standing resources that everything else is. So he says that the danger is that I'm just following the, uh, the gendered language of the original essay <laughs> as translated. The danger is that man is totally dominated by the essence of technology. And therefore, precisely nowhere does man today any longer encounter himself, that is, his essence. The supreme danger is one, things concern us only as standing reserve or resources. And human beings are nothing but those who set in order the standing reserve and become part of it. For example, uh, there's a horrific professor of philosophy called something like Harari, um, who gave a little talk on YouTube about human beings are uh, hackable animals. And uh, there's a quote on the first page of this document, if you have any interest at all in this. Um, and he, he makes this comment that, you know, in previous ages, the Gestapo, the KGB did not have the power to hack animals that we do now and governments and corporations will soon have the full power to hack the human animal. Um, interesting. So but that's exactly what Heidegger means by human beings becoming the resource or the standing reserve of our technological edifice. That's one alternative. The second alternative um, is that humanity uh, 
exalt itself as the Lord of the earth and become deluded to thinking that everywhere and always it only encounters itself. Um, and that, that is the consummation of the technological age uh, as expressed, say, by Nietzsche, who says, now, this is beyond good and evil, I think 188, he says, uh, the, the, the philosopher will stand before humanity as the artisan did before his material. Uh, and in, in his view, it would be to create new values or whatever. But that's to make humanity the object of human, of him, of the process of human construction or productivity itself. Now, having brought us to what he takes to be the supreme danger, uh, he then quotes a couple of lines of Herdlin to the effect that where danger is, grows the saving power also. And this is his articulation of our possible amelioration of our situation. So thus in framing as a destining of revealing is indeed the essence of technology, but never in the sense of genus and ascentia. If we pay heed to this, something astounding strikes us. It is technology itself that makes the demand on us to think in another way what is usually understood by essence. So technology can't be understood as a tool or an instrument, as a species of an act of activity and so on. It makes us rethink the, the meaning of essence because the essence of technology is an historical dispensation by which we reveal the world in a certain way. So it, thinking upon technology allows us to see that meaning and truth is historical and that opens up the possibility that there are other historical dispensations accessible to well, that may culminate, may occur, may happen for human beings. So the saving power is the realization that the essence of technology is an historical dispensation. That is not up to human beings to make or unmake. And in fact, it's not intelligible. The innermost indestructible belongingness of man within granting the dispensation, the allotment of history, etc., may come to light provided that we, for our part, begin to pay heed to the coming presence of technology. That is, the being or the meaning of things is entirely a mystery. So philosophy is now, uh, well, he's gone beyond philosophy, as, as he often says, you know, he's beyond, beyond uh, philosophizing to thinking. Awareness of the mystery can affect nothing. And it if it did, it would play into the essence of technology, that is the role of cause and effect, as did the philosophy in Plato, of Plato and Aristotle. The force of Heidegger's inquiry culminates yeah, only in an unintelligible hope, which I regard hopes that are unintelligible as not magnificently helpful. So that's my reservation about the culminating part of the essay. I've been talking for a very long time. So if you will allow me, I will very quickly summarize a couple of suggestions about Plato and Aristotle, and then more than happy to open it up to a, a more full discussion. I'll just very quick reference to Plato's cave, which I'm sure many people are familiar with that, you know, human beings, uh, uh, this is the, Im the images that human beings are prisoners in a cave that can only see the shadows on the wall, but there's two sources of light. One is a torch within the cave, uh, and the other is the, the light outside the cave. So uh, what that means, to be extremely brief, um, is that each people or culture or linguistic group or whatever has a means of illuminating the world that is particular to that people, culture, linguistic group. But there is an access to the actual truth, the truth by nature, that interpenetrates, he says, the cave is open all along its mouth. So uh, all cultures are to some degree open to the actual truth. Now, Heidegger's uh, view is that there is a clearing of intelligibility for a people, but they're all particular. There's, there's no truth by nature because nature itself, the notion of nature belongs to one particular kind of clearing. So what, what uh, sorry, Plato calls the ideas, the things themselves, the things that are true by nature, um, Heidegger uses the same term, the things themselves, for the products of poiesis, the founders, the makers of the original language 
that informs a culture. Okay, that's very brief. Uh, now, I wanted to discuss slightly more at length what Aristotle is saying. Um, and I'll, I'll just summarize something of what we have here so I can read a few of the lines and get to a conclusion. Um, now, Aristotle in the politics, and I'm going to read this bold quote from the politics, um, raises the prospect of technology. He says, if each instrument, each tool, organon, um, were able on command or by anticipation um, to fulfill its telos, its end, just as they say those of uh, Daedalus, this mythical statue maker whose statues moved and accomplished works, right? Um, those of Daedalus or the tripods of Hephaestus do, um, which tripods, the poet says, entered spontaneously or automatically, automatos, <laughs> from which we get automaton, uh, into the gathering of the gods, so that the shuttles were to weave themselves and the pletras play the lyres, then master artisans would have no need for subordinates nor masters for slaves. So we now have pletras that play lyres uh, and we have shuttles that weave themselves. We still haven't managed to eliminate the need of masters for subordinates, um, although we've gone some considerable way to eliminating the crime of slavery. It's not totally eliminated either, but uh, it's seen for the crime it is. But that, sorry, that's, that's a picture of um, what technology could accomplish. Now, technology requires the unfettered development of the techni, the arts and sciences. And later in this same book, Aristotle is going to raise a question about whether or not there should be such unfettered development. To get there, I'm just going to introduce uh, one other quote from book three. And this is a sort of um, a posteriori uh, illustration that some of the same questions can be equally visible to ancients and moderns. He says that the political community is not a contract for sharing in a place and not committing injustice against one another and mutual trade. So he's summarizing and dismissing Hobbes and Locke, that by nature we make a social contract uh, in order to not have injustice done against ourselves and to share a place and to trade. These things must be present, so they're the necessary condition, if there is to be a political community, but not even when all are present, is there a political community? but only when there is a sharing and living well for families and tribes, that is the parts, the, the peoples that make up a political community for the sake of a complete and self-sufficient life. And that formula, a complete and self-sufficient life is the formula that he develops in chapter seven of book one of the ethics for what's the clue to human happiness? And his answer is human excellence as characterized by us being the animals with logos, which can be enveloped in two ways, excellences of character, and excellence of, of intellect. Okay, so then I, I just come to this final passage from Aristotle, where he's discussing the development of the, of the arts and sciences. And he begins with his suggestion. In general, everyone seeks not the traditional, but the good. So he's, if Aristotle in many respects look like a, a sort of a conservative thinker, um, but it's not because he's attached to any particular way he, like everyone else, wants what's good, not just what's handed down. Right? But he makes the following reservation. Um, from this, it's obvious that some conventions or laws, there's one Greek word for both. We now, laws for us means more regulations, but the word nomos in Greek means the full comprehensive written and unwritten habits, conventions, and customs by which a people live. Um, from, it, from this, it's obvious that some conventions or laws must be changed but for those examining the matter in another way, there would seem to be a great need for caution. And he's just pointed out that the Greeks had some very barbaric laws. They treated women even more unjustly than they treated them in Aristotle's age and things like that. And he said, so we've made these changes and they're to the, to the good. But, but changing the law requires caution because whenever the improvement is small and it's a bad thing to, to habituate people to lightly destroy, destroy laws and conventions, 
it's manifest that some errors in the legislators and rules, rulers must be allowed because the political community will not be benefited, benefited as much as, as it is harmed by being habituated to fail to be persuaded by the rulers. Okay, so you only have conventions and customs if they aren't always changed. And if you don't have conventions or customs, you're not going to replace them with the full uh, openness to the truth. You're going to replace them with open power. And that, that's the possibility that we are heading towards. The paradigm of the arts, the techno, is false. Change in an art or a technology or a science is not the same as a change in a law or a convention. Because the law or convention has no strength for obedience or persuasion apart from havoc, which does not come about except through long usage, so that easily changing laws or conventions for new and different ones makes the power of law or convention itself weak. Now, um, I come to a concluding suggestion, possibly somewhat hyperbolic. Um, and I'll skip to the latter part of it. It is more hyperbolic. Okay. Now, if we accept modern natural science as the standard of reason, we have two options. One, every aspect of human significance in our experience is a fiction. That's Nietzsche. Every active, act, aspect of human significance uh, is no longer accessible to reason, Heidegger. Um, and then I, I make this suggestion. We have radically increased our power over nature as a whole and human beings in particular. But not only have we not commensurately increased our understanding of the ends by which we should use our new powers, our understanding of those ends shrinks with the increasing of those powers. That I think is our situation. The rev revolution in human life brought about by Bacon and Descartes and other very many other extremely important thinkers, scientists, inventors, and so on, consisted in a radical change in the relation between science and philosophy on the one hand and the political community on the other. This change required radical alterations in what science and philosophy is and in what the political community is. One, science or philosophy had to become practical as uh, Descartes immediately attested to in the sixth discourse on method. That is science or philosophy has to become directly productive of public goods. Whereas classically, it was understood to be indirectly of benefit through the education of lawmakers, citizens, and so forth. On the other side, the political community had to become open to science by recognizing as good only those goods that, are, that a practical and productive science could produce. Such a science is unsatisfactory for the philosophical human soul. Every human soul is to some degree philosophical. And such goods will lead to the self-destruction or the repudiation of the society that seeks those goods to the exclusion of others. This is the problem of technology. That's my suggestion, which I, I'll stop sharing. Um, and I'll stop the recording and be prepared.